For now, I think uh, the second Simon, <laughs> Simon Lee and I am, we're going to have another exciting <laughs> talk to all of us. Uh, Dr. Simon Lickham is Associate Professor of Gastroenterology and a Wellcome Trust Senior Research Fellow in Clinical Science of the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics in Oxford. He was appointed as the Director of Oxford University Center of Personnel's Medicine in May 2016. The CMP is an innovative partnership between the Wellcome Trust Center and St. Anne College in Oxford to undertake clinical student and public engagement activity regarding the inter integration of a biological and technology to tailor healthcare. Thank you uh, for your lecture. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. It's a, a huge privilege and an honour to be here in Macau. It's my first visit to here, but it's lovely to see old friends like Patrick and Isabel Huon. Uh, it's a real honour to be here with esteemed colleagues from Chinese University of Hong Kong and the University of Macau. It's a great privilege to be here, and thank you very much for the invite. Now, I am a, a clinician scientist, and, and uh, as indeed will some of my colleagues who are following speaking later. That's where I try to combine doing gastroenterology practice, I'm a gastroenterologist, together with being a lab scientist as well. Now, in Simon's orchestral analogy, he had the lab scientist playing the piano, and he had the, uh, the, uh, the endoscopist blowing on the trombone. So perhaps me trying to do both is me blowing very hard onto a piano. So I'll let you make your mind up about how effective that may be. But uh, we, we try very hard. So uh, I'm going to talk about a really exciting subject, I think. I'm going to talk about personalised medicine in cancer. Uh, now, cancer is uh, probably the model where personalised medicine is most advanced because cancer is a genetic disease and understanding genetics allows us to think about how we treat patients. And although we're not there yet with personalised medicine, I think I'd like to show you where that we've come a fair way uh, and that we're certainly on the path to an interesting future. So first of all, let's just talk about what personalised medicine is. It's a phrase that's heard a lot. Uh, it's a synonym as well. It, it has other names like precision medicine, genomic medicine, stratified medicine. What actually does this mean? Well, the way we think about personalised medicine is, 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 is as a type of medical care in which the treatment is customised to an individual patient. Now, in the way I reflect on this as somebody who's interested in genetics and genomics, I think of this as the application of our powerful new genomic technologies to help us guide our clinical decision making. Now cancer is a genetic disease, I've, I've mentioned that already. So cancer has been well known to be a genetic disease and it's probably the archetypal uh, g um, uh, disease uh, of somatic mutation. And this is a, a, a figure that describes the somatic mutation pathway of carcinogenesis here. We've got a cell, an individual cell, which through whatever reason, perhaps through a carcinogen exposure, perhaps through uh, a virus, uh, undertakes a genetic mutation, which you can see I've shown here with a little, uh, little yellow cross. So that genetic change bestows upon that cell a fitness advantage. Somehow it's now growing faster and more uh, successfully than its surrounding cells. So it divides. And as it divides, it shares that mutation amongst all its daughter cells. Because it's dividing faster than other cells, it's then at risk of acquiring more mutations. And lo and behold, here is another mutation here. You can see this red chromosome has acquired a new mutation in which the half of the chromosome is broken off. And that again bestows another fitness advantage on the cell. So suddenly you've got a cell that's dividing faster than other cells and acquiring more mutations. And eventually, over a process of years, that can lead to the transformation of that cell into a malignant cell. And suddenly, the cell division, which is so strictly controlled and carefully controlled, all of that is gone, and that cell divides in an out-of-control fashion, which is one of the hallmarks of cancer. It's loss of control of normal cell division. And sadly, then, that, the other ability of cancer is that it can spread. It spreads to other organs, and that's, I'm afraid, what kills so many patients around the world. So when we're talking about personalised medicine, I often get, when, when I'm giving discussions like this at, uh, in the UK, I often get a lot of people asking me about why we haven't seen the clinical improvements from personalised medicine, from genomic technology, that perhaps you might expect. And I've, these are all comments that I've had giving talks. 
People have said to me, your margins of clinical improvement are very small with this. Is this money well spent? The NHS in England is in constant state of crisis. There isn't money to go spare. So should we be spending money on advanced technology like this? What clinical benefit has genomics and this genomic technology actually delivered to patients? And is this all rich country medicine and navel gazing when perhaps malaria is killing two million patients a year in, worldwide? Is it a little bit, uh, uh, is a little bit of, uh, of, of you know, uh, excess that we like to indulge with in the industrialised world? And I like to think about when people talk about personalised medicine as hype, I like to show this figure, which is the Gartner hype cycle. This may well be familiar to people. This is uh, a visibility on the, uh, so visibility of a technology on, the, uh, on this axis and the maturity of that technology uh, along, the axis, uh, along this axis here. And you can see that there is a curve that starts with a technology trigger, which rapidly rises to a peak of inflated expectation before crashing and falling down to the trough of disillusionment, followed by the slope of enlightenment and eventually the plateau of productivity. So this is a business, this is a business model, but I think it fits very nicely for personalised medicine. I'd like to go through the history of, of cancer medicine to see, how, uh, to see if you can believe me. So the technology trigger here is relatively easy. It starts with the sequencing of the human genome back in 2000. US and UK um, scientists worked on it for a number of years. There are three billion base pairs in the human genome. It cost about a dollar for every base pair to sequence. So the first human genome cost about three billion dollars to come up with. Uh, and thankfully, at least if you invest three billion dollars, you should at least get a nature paper. And they did get one. So, uh, so well done to them. But there was a, a, there was a clear, uh, a, you know, a clear clear watershed moment with Tony Blair and Bill Clinton uh, and Tony Blair who was our Prime Minister at the time he was given sometimes to say hyperbole but I think he was actually right when he said that today's announcement is such a breakthrough a breakthrough that opens the way for massive advancement in the treatment of cancer and hereditary disease and that is only the beginning and I think there he's got he's hit the money <coughs> So the peak of inflated expectation, so if you start at the hype cycle with our uh, technology trigger, we move very rapidly up to the peak of inflated expectation, and that came, I think, fairly soon afterwards. Uh, and this is it. The, uh, the peak of, of targeted, this was the first targeted therapy. Um, and this was for a condition called chronic myeloid leukemia, which many people will know is a nasty blood cancer. Uh, it, it's caused by something called the Philadelphia chromosome, which had been known about for many years because people could see it under the microscope. We didn't really know what that chromosome was doing and how it led to this nasty hematological cancer. And, and it became clear when you could start to sequence and interrogate the genome what the cause of this was, because here is the Philadelphia chromosome. It's, it's a fusion of, the, of a part of chromosome 9, which contains a gene called ABEL, which controls cell growth. And another, uh, uh, another fraction of a chromosome, chromosome 22. And that fraction contains a gene called BCR. And that also controls cell growth. Now, in the normal situation, those genes are very tightly controlled. So they're not on all the time. They're only on when they need to be. But in a, in a Philadelphia chromosome, where you put those two genes together, what happens is the loss of that control. And all of a sudden, a nasty oncogene called BCR ABEL was formed, and that turns over the cell uh, growth the whole time. And it's simply that mutation that leads to chronic myeloid leukemia. Well, what did this mean? Once you'd identified that you've got an oncogene that's on all the time, if you can try and block that oncogene or the protein that comes from that oncogene, then you may be able to treat the disease. And that's what this drug did, this drug here called Gleevec. Uh, it was uh, licensed in about 2001, and what it does is it recognises that this BCR able protein requires a, a pocket of it has an energy pocket which requires an ATP molecule to work. So the drug simply slots into that ATP pocket and stops the BCR able gene uh, protein from working, and all of a sudden you've got a, a potential treatment for this uh, this mutant oncogene. And this is what it did to the treatment of, uh, of chronic myeloid leukemia. Here you can see that in the, uh, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, um, the treatment for uh, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia advanced a little bit, but really wasn't a very good treatment. In fact, you know, sort of between about 30 to 50% of people with chronic myeloid leukemia died. 
But following the year 2001 and the introduction of Gleevec, suddenly you've got an eminently curable disease. And this was the first example of a targeted therapy based on a genomic uh, interrogation that helped actually cure cancer. So this was the peak of inflated expectation. Now, the luster started to fade, I'm afraid. So this is uh, some work from a good friend of mine, Charlie Swanton, um, uh, published in the New England Journal in 2007. Uh, and this is uh, a, a paper done on some work in um, uh, uh, renal cancer. This is a big, ugly renal cell carcinoma. And what Charlie and his colleagues did was to take multiple regions of that renal cell carcinoma. And I don't know if you can see it from the side, but you can see that this, this cancer looks a little bit different in all the regions across it. It looks a bit odd. Up here, it's quite beefy red. Down here, it's quite yellow. So they asked the question, well, if it looks different, what's its genetics like? What's, what's the genetic makeup of this tumour? So they took lots of different biopsies. They sequenced all those biopsies, and lo and behold, sadly, this tumour was absolutely packed with a variety of different clones. So this wasn't one uh, molecular clone that was expanding like it is in perhaps in chronic mild leukaemia. This is multiple clones, all evolving in independent fashion. And Charlie, when he published this, he was a big fan of Darwin, as I think most of us here will probably are. Um, and Darwin, of course, drew this famously, drew this sketch in his notebook to show how he thought uh, evolution of species occurred. And Charlie, I'm sure, set up his, uh, his phylogenetic tree model to look just like Darwin's tree, because he was trying to get across the idea here is that you have multiple clones all evolving at different times and different spaces. And that makes cancer a really, really complex uh, bit of biology. And this is, uh, this is the trough of disillusionment. This is crashing down to the trough of disillusionment. This is the, uh, uh, the recognition of resistance to targeted therapies. This is a horrible picture, uh, and, uh, and I apologize for showing you, but I think it's very, very illustrative. This gentleman here is a 39-year-old gentleman with, uh, with metastatic melanoma, which is a nasty inc uh, and often incurable skin cancer at this stage. This is back in 2011. Uh, and here we can see this gentleman with his multiple lumps, his sallow skin colour, his cachectic frame. He's got all of these individual lumps here are all lumps of malignant melanoma. Now, malignant melanoma is a gene that in about 50% of cases has a mutation in an oncogene called BRAF. And this gentleman with his widespread metastasis had a few weeks to live. A new BRAF inhibitor was around, and, the, and, and of course when you're a patient, a 39-year-old gentleman with malignant melanoma like that, you'll probably try it. So he had a go on it, and this is what happened to him just a few weeks later. So this is his same, same patient, all the lumps have gone, his skin colour is better, I'm sure that's to some extent the lighting in the room, but his skin colour is better, and suddenly he's gained weight, he's less cachectic, he looked better. And that's a remarkable picture. Sadly, this is the same gentleman. What happened between here and here is that the, patient, the patient's cancer became resistant to that targeted therapy that was so effective uh, initially. The cancer evolved, the cancer was polyclonal, it evolved, and suddenly the tumour evolves a new resistance mechanism and the drug no longer works. And the sad and rather shocking thing is, is that the development of that BRAF inhibitor, the mean, mean time for drug development is about nine years and it costs about two billion US dollars. And how long did it take for this patient's tumour to become resistant? 23 weeks. So all that time to develop a new agent, and within 23 weeks, less than six months, the, patient was, the patient's cancer was resistant to it, and he died a few weeks later. And when the, uh, one of the doyens of cancer medicine, Bert Vogelstein, says, resistance is therefore a fait accompli, the time to recurrence is simply the interval required for a subclone to repopulate the lesion. This was indeed the absolute trough of despair for personalised and targeted therapies in cancer. So, where are we on the height curve right now? If I put my, uh, uh, my analogies in here, we've got the technology trigger, which was sequencing the human genome. We've got our peak of inflated expectation, which was Gleevec for BCR able in chronic myeloid leukaemia. The luster starts to fade with tumour heterogeneity and clonal evolution, and the pit of despair was the short remission with targeted therapies. So where are, where are we now? I think we're about here. I think we're on the slope of enlightenment, heading to the plateau of productivity, and I'll try and explain why, uh, perhaps with a case history.
So the case I'm going to use here is a colorectal cancer. Well, not, not a case history, I'm more of a sort of case in point. Uh, I'm going to use this colorectal cancer because it's my field and I understand it and I know about it. And I see many people in the audience who also know about it. So I'm going to just take you through with some cultural references as a kind of, uh, an, idea of uh, an idea of how much genomic medicine has advanced our understanding of colorectal cancer in these pictures here. So I'm uh, of an age, unfortunately, when I remember all of the events, all of these worldwide events uh, here, and, I, and I'm sure there's, I see many in the audience who won't remember some of these events, but I see a few that will as well. So I'm going to start in 1987. Uh, in 1987, the Simpsons were just uh, were, were came out. There was a, another disease that was hardly understood at all. The first Kentucky Fried Chicken opened in Beijing. Uh, and in the UK, we had a hurricane, which is rather unusual. I remember it well because I got a day off school, so that was fantastic. But in 1987, uh, a team in Oxford, uh, a guy called Walter Bodmer, recognised that, um, that a group of patients that he was, he was working with called familial adenomatous polyposis patients all had a problem with chromosome 5Q and he was able to identify a point within that gene that seemed to have a mutation on it. So this was the first identified locus as the cause of a genetic cancer disease. So that's 1987. The first implication, not even identifying the gene, just identifying where on the, in, the, in the genome this, uh, this, uh, this problem might arise. And from 1987 to 1991, there was, of course, frantic efforts looking at chromosome 5Q to try and work out what the gene was. The technology in 1990, in the 19, early 1990s, was so uh, basic in comparison to what we have now. It took four whole years for them to clone the gene. Uh, and it was uh, uh, Bert Vogelstein, that, that doyen of cancer research I mentioned before, uh, and Ken Kinsler who identified the gene. And they identified that that locus on chromosome 5Q was the gene APC, or adenomatous polyposis coli, which is present in about 60 to 70% of colorectal cancers, is mutant in about 60 to 70% of colorectal cancers. And actually that unlocks a whole, a, whole new re, a whole new area of biology. We can then start to think about the signaling pathway that APC interacts with, that's called the WINT signaling pathway, and a door opens and a whole new world emerges. So if we go back to 1991, Star TV started, the Sino-Russian uh, border dispute was settled, uh, we had the Gulf War, I remember that the first day of the Gulf War I, I had my first interview at medical school, so I remember it well, uh, and there were a few interesting films and, and records coming out at the time. So let's fast forward now to 1993. Um, uh, here, this was the first time that people started to recognise that all, not all colorectal cancer was caused by that mutant APC gene, that there might be other causes of colorectal cancer. And this was based again on another familial syndrome called Lynch syndrome. And what, what was found then is that, in fact, the genes that were responsible for Lynch syndrome were another set of genes called MSH, MLH1, all of the, uh, the DNA repair genes that help to pick out the damage points in our DNA and repair them. So if you don't have an active DNA repair gene, you start to let mutations slip into your, into your genome and you can end up with another family cancer syndrome. So that was a, a second pathway, if you like, to colorectal cancer. And the references here, again, I remember Three Gorge Dam project started. This was a, a bomb uh, in, in London, which was just down the road from the medical school that I was. I heard it. It rattled the windows. Uh, Jurassic Park was out, and there was some hope for peace in the Middle East. Let's fast forward now to 1999. So again, another few years, another jump forward. And at this point, we started to recognize that there may be a third pathway to colorectal cancer. Uh, and that pathway was not mutation at all. It was actually epigenetic change. So epigenetic change is, the, is where a gene is methylated and turned off because it has a, a change in the sort of modulator functions that go on. And this was uh, characterized as CHIMP, or the CPG uh, methylator phenotype, called CHIMP. Um, and this then meant that there were now three potential pathways, all identified by careful molecular biological work, three different pathways to colorectal cancer. And of course, 1999, the turn of the millennium. Uh, sadly, there was a very nasty plane crash in Hong Kong airport. The euro was, uh, uh, was started. Uh, this thing uh, uh, was built in London. It cost a lot of money uh, and was a um, fairly ludicrous thing, but it's still there. Uh, and some nasty uh, other events and, uh, again, cultural references going on there. 
So now let's go forward to 2004, because now we're talking about having a much more advanced sequencing, or starting to get towards much more advanced sequencing technology, and out of that starts to emerge therapies. So we now start to understand pathways are aberrant in colorectal cancer. Let's try and target them with drugs. And here we've got two targeted therapies released for colorectal cancer, one called cetuximab, which works on the epidermal growth factor pathway, and another one called bevacizumab, or avastin, which actually targets the blood vessels in a cancer. So two interesting and exciting targeted therapies. They've had a slightly checkered path, especially the avastin, but both are still used in malignant disease today. And the references here, the screen was stolen from a, from a Norwegian art museum, the Taipei Tower opened, there was a shocking and horrendous tsunami uh, in, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and there were rather sad bombs in Madrid, and of course this is the year of the Athens Olympics. Moving forward again... Lots started to happen. So 2007 to 2009, we were able to start using genetics and genomics and all of the technologies that that led to to identify some really interesting biology. So LGR5 was identified as an intestinal stem cell marker. Intestinal organoids, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, a technology that many will be familiar with, started to be used. And the Corgi Consortium was the first genome-wide association studies, identifying up to about 23 different predisposition alleles <laughs> in colorectal rectal cancer and of course 2008 was the year of the fabulous Beijing Olympics but also the start of the worldwide financial crisis. So let's now move forward to 2015. Now, there's too much to talk about in the years between, um, but now we've got really exciting uh, uh, biology to, uh, to understand. We, we're able to subtype colorectal cancer into different molecular subtypes. So uh, I can see a patient uh, take a biopsy from their, uh, from their new cancer put that through a sequencing machine and understand exactly the molecular type that that cancer falls into and then start to think about whether we have any drug therapies that would be appropriate for that molecular subtype. And immunotherapy emerged uh, as, as emerged as an effective treatment, which is to harness the power of the immune system, and I'll come to that shortly, uh, in, in, in a subtype of colorectal cancer patients. And here, of course, everyone will remember all of these cultural events, but we had the climate change conference. Uh, America and Cuba seem to be able to talk to each other. And we've got Xi, uh, Xi Jinping meeting the Prime Minister of Taiwan. So let's just uh, sub summarise where we are now from cancer genetics revolution in t um, uh, starting in 2000. But in 2006 was the first time that a, a, a colorectal cancer was sequenced in its entirety. Now, the, the technology hadn't advanced to the point here that we were able to do that very quickly. So the, uh, the team that did it had to generate three million different PCR project, products and then stitch them all together. But they did show that there were at least 900 different mutations in a colorectal cancer. Forward to 2015, and we've got something like 422,000 cancer genomes sequenced around the world. You can do it in about 25 minutes. It costs about $1,000 a genome, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different driver mutations that have been identified. And then, thankfully, they're all off. many of this is deposited in, in resources that we can all use online. So what does that mean? I mean, these are unpleasant pictures, but these are, these are pictures of colorectal cancers down an endoscope, and these are pictures of colorectal cancers down a microscope. And I'm sure you'll agree that you couldn't really tell the difference between them if you look at them. But we can under, start to understand an awful lot more about their biology by applying sequencing technology. So we can understand the different signaling pathways that are going wrong. This is a picture of wind signaling in all its entirety. Wind signaling was, as I say, was the pathway that was first identified by the mutation of APC. And here you can see the complexity of this pathway. Each one of these little nodes has been identified in the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, and each one of these um, uh, has been characterized with the use of genomics. As I mentioned before, we can now subdivide colorectal cancer into four different molecular subtypes. So we can understand that, not, that one person's cancer is not the same as another person's cancer and perhaps therefore shouldn't be treated the same. And all of these different characteristics, all of these different subtypes have different prognosis as well. So the prognosis, it matters to patients. We've got, as I mentioned before, we've got treatments that we can actually target towards different mutations, uh, and we can start to generate clinical trials where we stratify patients based on their molecular characteristics. 
So the cost per genome, as I mentioned, has plummeted from $3 billion for the first one back in 2000 to about uh, $1,000 and probably getting even smaller. And actually, you can, you can use something else called targeted sequencing or whole exome sequencing. So just, tar- just, just sequencing little bits that are important. Uh, and because we, we now know what mutations are present in many cancers, we can actually use a targeted panel just to look at those genes. And that can cost as little as $100. So this is reaching the point where this is useful in clinical practice. We've got these wonderful ge- genomic resource libraries. I've highlighted just a few. The China Kadori Biobank is another one that I haven't put the icon on. But all of these contain free online access to a huge wealth of genomic data. Uh, and they're really very powerful tools. I just wanted to highlight a couple of, of real breakthroughs that genomic medicine has led to in cancer therapy because they're exciting and people will hear a lot about them. Uh, and I thought it was interesting to just understand them. So using those genomic resources that, we've lo- that we looked at, this is one from something called the Tumor Genome Atlas. And here you can see is a wide range of cancers that have been sequenced. And you can see that there's a wide range in mutation frequency across those cancers. So we're down the bottom here, we have pilocytic astrocytomas with hardly any mutations per base pair. But up here at the top end, we've got lung cancer and melanoma with many, many hundreds of, that, uh, hundreds of mutations, so many thousands of mutations. And these are the hypermutated tumours. Now, what does that mean? What's the relevance of that? Well, it means that if you've got hypermutation, if you've got lots of abnormal pro- genes making lots of abnormal proteins, your, your um, abnormal proteins start to wake the immune system up. So the immune system can be primed by these new antigens. And if we use drugs that stop the cancer from hiding from the immune system, we can actually use the power of the immune system to reattack the cancer. And this is the basis of immunotherapy, which is really leading the way in these hypermutated tumours like melanoma and lung. And the other breakthrough I think that's really worth mentioning because men- much of this has been led from Dennis Lowe here in, uh, here in Hong Kong, Macau, Um, This is a a fabulous bit of work where Dennis is able to extract from blood circulating DNA or cells, so tiny, tiny amounts, but extract them enough, and the technology is now good enough that he can detect uh, circulating DNA, he can detect mutations, uh, and he's the first one to demonstrate that this is cheap enough and effective enough to be used as a screening tool in the general population, which was really a groundbreaking, I think this will become a groundbreaking paper published just last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. So what does the future look like? Well, this is the oft, the oft shown uh, image of what personalized medicine means. Here we have a, a one size fits all approach. We have a gray population, which we are unable to really characterize. You treat them with a gray drug. And as Simon said, some of those patients will do well. Many of those patients will have no effect or too much toxicity. So as Simon mentioned, many of our drugs don't work for many of our patients. The idea of a personalized medicine approach is you take that gray population, you use sequencing technology to stratify them, to turn them from a gray population into a blue, into a yellow, to a green population. And then you make sure you've got some drugs that are specific and targeted to your red population, your yellow population, and your green population. And then everybody's happy, as you can see with these smiley faces. Are we there yet? We're not there yet, but we are moving in this direction. So personalised medicine is not restricted to the UK, and that's a, a slide that's gone slightly wrong in the sending because it's missed a picture here off of, of China's precision medicine uh, initiative, which is actually the largest. China has put something like $7 billion into uh, precision medicine and I think is, is aiming and, uh, and is highly capable of leading the world in this field. But what issues have we got with it? Well, we've got few issues with this. We've got cost. So despite the fact that genomic technology is getting cheaper and cheaper and the technological improvements and capacity building mean that this is a scalable technology, uh, we've got problems with how to afford this, especially in, a population, in, in, in our population where the NHS seems to be permanently strapped for cash. But I would argue that, um, uh, that if we can molecularly stratify our patients a bit more cleverly, we can decide who to give the right drugs to, or we can decide who not to give the right drugs to, or who not to give the, the drugs to. So we can try and use this to, to make, give the patients the right drug at the right time, and maybe save a bit by not giving patients a drug that won't be effective for them. So I, I, I put the question at the bottom, and I'm very happy to discuss it. Can, I put the question at the bottom is, can we afford not 
to, to integrate this sequencing technology into current practice. Another problem uh, is public engagement and enthusiasm. There is a bewildering increase in knowledge that's very hard to keep abreast of. As a scientist and a clinician that's interested in it, it must be utterly bewildering for our patients. Uh, sometimes, especially the media in the UK, comes up with an, a negative story about all of this. We've had scandals about something called the postcode lottery of drugs, where some drugs are available in some parts of the country and not in others. So these sorts of things make the public rather suspicious. There is also an inevitable slow pace, a slower pace of translation advance. So all of this genomic technology hasn't yet been translated into drug therapies, although I hope that that's coming. And then another really key point is this one down here, data protection. Data, uh, this is uh, genomic data is, is generating a vast amount of, uh, of data, but all of it is pointless without uh, integrated and associated clinical data. There's no point in having the genome of a patient without knowing what happened to that patient. So you have to marry the two up, and that's really important. But there is an embedded mistrust uh, from many people about clinical data falling into the hands of people like the pharma or insurance companies and suddenly you find that your insurance premium has gone up because uh, uh, the insurance companies think that you're about to get diabetes or cancer or something because of your genetics and this is a, a cartoon from the New Yorker I like it I don't know if it can be read but it says your previous provider refused to share your electronic medical records with us but not to worry I was able to obtain all of your information online so it's a, a great cartoon I think that illustrates the worries of many patients. Last, uh, uh, another issue I think as I've alluded to is that drug design and development lags. So it takes nine years and costs $2.3 billion to generate a new drug. Uh, uh, there is a, a gradual decline in the number of new drugs that we're generating and we really need to try and step that up. So I think industrial, academic, collaborative partnerships need, really need to be pushed forward to enhance new agent delivery. So to summarise all of this, sequencing technology continues to improve, the costs have dropped, it's now within the realms of clinical practice use. It has undoubtedly, undoubtedly advanced our understanding of disease biology and will continue to do so. And I think the refining of some of these molecular signatures is really leading the way to understanding how to treat our patients more accurately. It's led to some spectacular breakthroughs, and I've shown immunotherapy uh, and circulating DNA as, as some examples of that. Uh, but the drug discovery that's based on this is slow and costly, and I think we're not really there yet. So it's important that there is engagement with stakeholders and the public to help with the surmounting challenges. And I just wanted to highlight what the Stanley Home Medical Development Fund has done for us, because it, with, with the benefit of a very, generous, um, a very generous donation from Stanley Home Medical Development Fund, we were able to set up the Centre for Personalised Medicine, which is a collaborative between the Wellcome Centre for Human Genetics and St Anne's College. And that's helped us to really undertake some really important engagement events uh, across uh, a number of different platforms. We have uh, a wide range of events that run from year one to year four. We're increasing our number. We're increasing the number of people we're reaching. We have a website with free to uh, view videos that we, uh, we would encourage you all to go. We, everybody that speaks for us, we video and, on, uh, and their talks are available. Uh, and I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank the Stanley Ho Medical Development Fund, who's without without which this would never have happened. We're coming to the end of our first cycle of funding and we're really excited about what the future holds. So uh, and with that, uh, again, with the thanks to the Stanley Ho, because it's a great pleasure to be here to be able to thank you all in person. Uh, and uh, I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Excellent talk. Do I have any question on Graham? Yes, please. Hello. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Thanks, I'd like to ask a question on uh, personality medicine, not for cancer therapy, but for cancer prevention. Yes. Uh, because um, uh, what is your opinion in, say, screening for mm. cancer risk uh, and then uh, using that knowledge to personalize preventive care, like uh, using uh, evidence-based health supplements to reduce the risk of occurring cancers in a later time? 
I think you touch on a really important subject. So if, if, if our drug development in cancer is lagging behind, our drug development in, in preventative medicine is lagging even further behind, I'm afraid. But I think you're absolutely right. We, we now have, a, in, I'll take colorectal cancer as an example, uh, we, we now have a, a, a wide range, some 50 or so genomic variants that we know are in the public that we can test for with tests that cost about 30 US dollars. So we could test everybody for those genomic variants. And with, those, with the people that have lots of them, we could start to think about whether or not they should be having some specialised targeted chemo preventative. The problem is, is that we don't know what those targeted chemo preventatives are. Uh, and as I say, if, if drug development in cancer lags behind, we're even further behind in that. But I think you're absolutely right that there is, a, a, there is the potential for the future potential for understanding predisposition and how that may help to target um, health advice in the future. The, the, the point I must make is that each of those, each of those SNPs, each of those co common predisposition variants carries with it a tiny, uh, a tiny risk, so between 0 uh, and 1% usually, a tiny risk of cancer individually. It's when you have lots of them together that it becomes a slightly more powerful predictive test. But I'm sure that Professor Donnelly will talk a little bit about uh, predisposition and variants as well. But I think it's a really important subject. I suspect it's probably down the line of... Um, of, of trying to identify proper targeted therapies then. I'd just like to share with you also that's something we've done in Macau. Uh, actually, we've recently have, uh, done a, a pilot study in genomic screening for cancer's risk uh, in, a, in a several thousand patients, and uh, that has been uh, reported and accepted by uh, Nature. So, uh, Fantastic. Fantastic. Which cancer was that, Professor? No, this is... Uh, 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 it's it's a screening for uh, about 30 cancers using gene SNPs. That's hugely exciting. So many congratulations. Simon, once again, a great talk. So one of the crazy and terrible things about cancers is that they evolve. And as you said, they accumulate more and more mutations. Why is that? And do they accumulate mutations faster than somatic cells? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, yes, they do accumulate mutations faster than somatic cells, mainly because they're dividing faster than somatic cells. So the, the mutations that, go th that, uh, that start the cancer off make, often give that cell a fitness advantage. It divides faster or it damages its DNA repair mechanisms, which means that the accumulation, the sort of the rolling stone, gathers pace. So I would say, yes, um, cancer cells probably do accumulate mutation faster than normal cells, but normal cells do accumulate mutation too. Too. And we see that if you sequence normal gut, for example, you can see the, um, uh, the, uh, the, we can find mutations present. What's very interesting and alluding back to Simon Travis's talk is that in inflammatory conditions, of course, that's, that, um, uh, that accumulation mutation in normal tissue is faster. So where you have inflammation and repair, your normal tissue will pick up more mutations too. But cancer, you know, cancer is, I think, is evolution in, uh, you know, that you can see, you can almost see. It's, a, it's a, to some extent, a beautiful thing, but also a very frightening thing. So then would anti-inflammatories be useful to manage cancer? Would and are they? So, um, uh, and Simon and Sue may be able to help here. I mean, there is, there is some evidence that if you can, you can uh, cause mucosal healing, so you can, you can in the IBD, for, again, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, if you can get the mucosa to heal and not to have this cycle of inflammation repair, inflammation repair, that your cancer risk is lower. So inflammatory bowel disease is associated with cancer when it has sustained, prolonged inflammation in a widespread fashion. Uh, thank you, Professor Liam, for such a fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, based on the current uh, personalized medicine data, um, are there any patients that are not suitable for immunotherapy or T-cell therapy? And if there are, uh, what would be uh, the effective ways to combat cancer evolution in these patients? So, so immunotherapy is really obviously is, is, a, is, a, is, the latest, is the latest trend. It's a fantastically exciting uh, thing. Certainly, and again, I will come back to my field if I may, because I think colorectal cancer illustrates this. Um, immunotherapy is only effective in hypermutated, microsatellite unstable colorectal cancer. That makes up about 15%. It's not effective, and this was a trial in New England Journal, it's not effective in the, in the other 85% uh, you know, of microsatellite stable. 
stable cancers. So we're going to have to think again. For, when, for the tumours that we have where immunotherapy is effective, it's proven hugely successful and very exciting, and I think will evolve further. Combination therapies will be the next thing we'll see. But in the ones where it doesn't work, we've got a whole new load of biology to unpick. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we have to catch the timetable. Uh, well, thank you, thank uh, you. Uh, Dr. Leeham. And uh, I, I believe that this is a very good, uh, good, good uh, sharing. As people, people have a good time and bad. Uh, uh, we go up and down. It's quite normal. Uh, but I do believe that uh, we cannot. Uh, I cannot uh, spend two billion in in twenty three weeks, and nobody could do that. So everybody talk about how can we do prevention using the concept of the precision medicine. Of course, uh, this will raise up another uh, problem that like. Uh, a very famous uh, example, Angelina Jolie. Uh, she took uh, the opportunity of uh, precision medicine to find out she may have uh, breast cancer. Of course, uh, she made a personal uh, decision uh, to perform a bilateral mastectomy. Of course, uh, she will not have uh, breast cancer no more. And you talk about um, uh, the, the, the gen genotyped library, isn't it? So in the future, Hopefully, if we, we can use the precision medicine for prevention disease, uh, this may be an, an outcome. Uh, but as a matter of fact, if everybody have a genotyped uh, 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 record uh, in, in the data bank, maybe in the future, uh, if we want to get married to meet a friend, a girlfriend, a, a boyfriend, and then, well, I, I, I'd like to know uh, your genotype will, <laughs> you know, I think this is an ethic uh, problem rather than uh, scientific, but I don't, well, stop the timetable no more, please.